recording uh, the session. You all see um, up in front of us that this week is going to be our start to probability. So this is like uh, we're finally getting to some content of this course. This whole course so far has been a lot of setup and explaining like different tools from the world of mathematics that we use and statistics. And a lot of it has just kind of been building to something. And so we are now starting the content that this course is building to. But because it's been so kind of such kind of build up and, um, you know, a little scattered, I think, uh, I thought we'd open today with a Q&A just in case anybody had any questions about things we've seen, um, specific topics we've covered, maybe the general context of stats, uh, really anything you want. I just thought I'd give you all some time to ask questions in case we had them. I know. I offer office hours, but not everybody. I certainly don't get 22 participants in office hours every week. So go for it. You can type them into the chat if you don't want to say them out loud. And if we sit here for too long in silence, I'll start asking you all questions. Uh -oh. Uh, my guess is most of the engineers are going to be heavy statistics users in their futures. So that was a question in um, the chat. How often do civil engineers use statistics? And my guess is that stats comes up a lot across all the different engineering uh, disciplines. My day's been OK. I've been uh, almost productive. Uh, I was continuing. I finished adding all of your guys' questions to my online worksheets today. So that was good. Now I just have to do my worksheets. I have to get the answers. How about you, Gary? How was your day? Good to hear. Hey, Edward, after you had uh, kind of briefly described the different levels of infinity, will we mm -hmm. be continuing that line of thought? Or is it like we have an understanding, like I'm curious how much that will be involved in the stats process? Yeah, so the um, sizes of the sample space comes up a lot, not in like a, we actually bother with counting the sizes ourselves, but we use the distinction a lot. Uh, and the most immediate example I can give you is the one, two, three, fourth bullet point down, the difference between discrete versus continuous distributions comes down to the size of the sample space on which the density function is defined. So we have these two general classes of distributions in the world of statistics, and it all comes down to the size of the set on which the density function is defined. So this distinction comes up repeatedly throughout the semester in reference to these two different classes of distributions, discrete and continuous. So it's not like we're gonna be presenting a new set and then trying to calculate um, its size or doing any kind of hands-on calculations with it. But the general idea, the understanding that there's uh, magnitudes to infinity comes up in these two different classes of distributions, which are repeatedly referenced throughout the semester, and cool. repeatedly referenced throughout the world of statistics. Well, thanks. Sounds sure. like it's going to be basically a bread and butter kind of thing. Not sure I know what that means, but you sound good with it, so I'll agree. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> good question. Thank you.
And I'm glad we covered that one because um, that one does come up quite a bit. And I really want to make sure that, you know, you all have an understanding of uh, countable versus uncountable sets. That is inherently the distinction we're looking at. So are there any follow-up questions to this distinction between countable, which uh, includes finite, and uncountable sets? Um, I, can we include imaginary numbers instead? But like, we can't do that, right? Well, sure, we could. It's just they don't come up so much in the world of statistics, so I largely just ignore them. But if you were to include imaginary numbers, then you would uh, continue to be in a realm of uncountable sets. The imaginary numbers are their own uh, set of numbers that is, in fact, um, bigger than the natural numbers, as I said. So we would call the set of complex numbers uncountable. So you can certainly reference that set, the set of complex numbers, which is numbers with both real and imaginary parts. You can certainly reference them in the same language we've introduced. And you would call the set of complex numbers uncountable, even if uh, we won't reference them throughout this class. Okay, also a good question, thank you. What else we got? We're doing good here. Are you all okay with the different distributions we've looked at so far? Like if I just named a few, do you think you could give me some examples? Maybe some examples we haven't seen before. So that uh, convinces me that you've been thinking about them on your own. Yeah, can you try? Yeah, let's do it. How about Bernoulli? Can somebody give me an example of a Bernoulli distribution? Certainly, binary is one of the major categorizations of one of the major properties of Bernoulli. So what you'd have to do to give me an example of a Bernoulli distribution is name some process in this world that has a binary outcome, only two possible values that the process could uh, take on. A light switch, maybe? <laughs> nice. It's not very random, but that works. <laughs> a light switch is binary. And if there was some random component to it, we would generally think of it as a binary, as following a binary distribution. Um, everything in this universe is either a penguin or not. That works in the sense of binary, but I think y'all are missing the random component. So if we were to make this penguin example, a distribution, someone would have to select an animal from the universe at random and say, okay, I've got a penguin here hidden and you, or I've got an animal here hidden and you can't see it. Is it a penguin or is it not a penguin? And then they'd show you the penguin or they'd show you the animal and it would be either a penguin or not. So you could make that be random, but it's obviously kind of contrived because nobody's going to hide from you a randomly selected animal. Okay, there we go. Now we're getting a little bit closer. You wouldn't say, uh, let me do these in order. You wouldn't say the chance of rainfall next day because maybe the probability of rainfall is a number between zero and one, but you could say whether or not it will rain tomorrow. So if it's going to rain tomorrow, we might mark it a one. And if it does not rain tomorrow, we might mark it a zero. So we have made the decision of whether it rains or not into a binary variable. If it rains one, if it does not rain zero. I like that example a lot more because it involves the random component. Uh, even though here in Chico, we're pretty sure it's not gonna rain tomorrow, it could. So there is some probability that it would, that it could rain tomorrow, even if the probability is small. So a coin flip is good. That's sort of the classic example we've had for a Bernoulli distribution. I was hoping for uh, non, I was hoping for new examples. Um, so I'm gonna keep the rainfall example as our best 
example uh, yet. Good work, Jonathan. Um, let's see if we can try another one. Uh, how about the gamma distribution? The time you until the that... next apocalyptic event. Okay, so I like the sense that it is a random time until an apocalyptic event. The piece I don't like about it is that there can only be one. So you can't really have um, many of these times until that specific event. So I like that it's a random time, but I don't like that it's not repeatable. Most of our examples have been repeatable in some sense. Even if they happen at different times, we can still imagine that they can be repeated in some way. Time until mm -hmm. the lights flutter. Whose lights, Jared? What lights? There's like your lights in your house or something. Or... Sure. Uh, yeah, so let's make it a little bit more uh, concrete time until like your overhead lights burn out. I, and I then you, that was the case, like it, if it needed to be like specific. Yeah, generally they are incredibly specific. They're generally specific to time and place and context. So generally they're very specific. So um, there might be a difference between the type of light bulbs you buy and the type of light bulbs I buy. I don't know if that's true. I'm just making it up to give you an example. And so if we buy different types of light bulbs, then each of us would have different gamma distributions to describe the time until the next light bulb in our house burns out. Because we bought different, dis uh, different light bulbs, we might have different distributions describing them. If I bought the cheap light bulbs, maybe mine burn out at a much quicker rate and so the time between burnouts is much shorter. And if you bought more expensive light bulbs, maybe uh, the time until the next one burns out is much longer as compared to mine. So we would use two different gamma distributions to describe those. Uh, time until class is over is not random. So I wouldn't call that a distribution. We know exactly when class is gonna be over, at least within a minute or so. Um, what about the world explained? doesn't end multiple times, right? So that was a comment on the apocalypse example. Time until the next recorded car accident on I-5. That is a totally real world example that insurance companies are very much interested in. And in fact, we might even specify the context a little bit more. If you were like a state farm insurance adjuster, you might be specifically interested in time until the next recorded car accident on I-5 that involves a car insured under state farm. Okay. Repeated injuries that are not expected. Certainly if you're in the world of sports, and you've got a baseball pitcher that is like going to win you the World Series, you need to know the average time in between that pitcher's shoulder injuries. That's a great example. Uh, yeah, okay. Got more comments on this State Farm example, nice. Okay, um, is this doing okay for these examples for the gamma distribution? Is this helping us see some differences between what should be and shouldn't be distributions? I was wondering, uh, with the time until something rusts, like, could you predict that though? So generally what we do in the world of statistics is collect a lot of data. So if you're looking at the time until something rusts, you would have to have enough data to help you predict it. So if you were just wondering like the time until your bike rusts, we probably wouldn't be able to predict that very well in the world of statistics. But if on the other hand, you were like a bike shop, like a bike company downtown, and you had a bunch of bikes in your possession, which were slowly starting to rust one after the other after time, you would have from one bike, 
a time until it started to rust and from another bike, a time until it started to rust and from another bike, a time until it started to rust. And then from all of these different data points, you could calculate something like the average time until a bike in Chico rusts. And then you might be able to predict it very well. So the world of statistics is largely useless without data. But once you have data, it can make very accurate predictions. Is that fair enough? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, another okay. one could be time yeah. until the next earthquake. Perfect. In California, they in fact think they have that measured to a certain degree of accuracy. Um, now, whether or not they're going to predict that well is a different story, but they think they have that measured to a certain degree of accuracy. It's probably not as accurate as any of us want, but they think they have it measured. That is a great example. There was a big earthquake at, um, at Ridgecrest where I live, mm -hmm. and they didn't tell us at all before it happened. Right, right. So as much as they think they can predict earthquakes reasonably well, uh, many of them are still completely by surprise. Yeah. Okay, I'm moving on from Q&A. Um, I think that was a really good session. I appreciate everybody who engaged with it in one way or another. Um, hopefully we can do that again in future uh, classes because I think it really helps us kind of gain a better contextual understanding of the coursework. And for now, we're gonna move on to the definition of probability as a function. Y'all probably have never thought of probability as a function, but indeed it is. And that's why y'all are in this class to figure out um, how it acts as a function. Then we'll go through an example. I'll sort of take a quick tangent into that world of countable and uncountable sets. So as to define for us this uh, two different classes of distributions. I'll remind us about probability as being area under a function because it is, uh, and that's what tells us that it's not equal to density. And then I am anticipating that we will not have time for the very last bullet point. We didn't have time for the last bullet point in the first section of this class. So I'm also intending for us not to. And instead I have made a video for that last one slide um, of this lecture and I've posted on YouTube already. So let's get moving. We are going to do the definition of probability as a function. Okay, so probability is going to be a bold capital P that I'm gonna write like this and I'll write out the LaTeX for us in a minute here. And probability as a function is gonna take us from, uh, here's the crazy part, sets in the sample space to the interval of real numbers between zero and one. So if we want to write out this entire expression in LaTeX, you would go slash math BB. In curly braces, you'd put a capital P, colon, S, capital S, slash two, bracket zero, comma one, bracket. So the thing we really need to note about probability is that probability is a set function. That means it's a function that takes sets as arguments. So that's the craziest part about probability in my mind we are used to functions that take numbers and act on the numbers, but probability is a function that takes sets and acts on the sets. And yet it returns a real number bounded between zero and one. So once it takes the set, it needs to then calculate a number somehow from that set. Okay, any immediate questions on probability as a function? OK, 
Okay. So we're going to move on and give us the axioms of probability. So axioms are like uh, properties that must hold. I actually don't know why they don't just call them the properties of probability, but they don't. They call them axioms. But you can think of them as properties of probability, things, statements that must hold such that if they don't hold, you, then you're not working with a probability function. So the first axiom is that the probability of the entire sample space is equal to one. So we might say in English, probabilities are bounded above by one. And I hope that all kind of resonates with your previous experience with probabilities. You cannot have probabilities bigger than one. If you have a function that takes the entire sample space and returns any number bigger than one, then you do not have a probability. You do not have a probability function. You in fact have maybe a different function that acts on sets, but it's not a probability. Okay, so that's where we get bounded above by one for probability. The second one tells us that probabilities are not negative. And this holds for any A that's a subset of the sample space. And we might as well read this one as probabilities bounded below by zero. So again, I hope that kind of resonates with your past experience of probabilities. These two here tell us that probabilities must be between zero and one. You cannot have a probability outside of that range. For if you do, then you have broken one of the axioms and we say you don't have a probability function. So I hope the first two aren't too bad. Given you a 20 second delay in case there's any interjections, you disagree about the badness of the first two. They're not too bad, I don't think. Is when that you say, symbol, sorry, uh, is no, that symbol good. a subset equal s or is that yes. a less than? Okay. Uh, yeah, you can't compare sets with less than. You have to do subsets sort of thing. So this is subset equal. Thank you. Yeah. OK, that was one question. Thank you. It sounded like there was another. No, that was basically the same thing. I was going to ask if that's a less than or equal to, but subsets works. Great. Thanks. OK, the last axiom of probability is by far the most annoying to see written out. But once you kind of understand it, it's not so bad. It makes a statement about the probability of a countable union of sets. And it says to find this probability, what you should do is add up all the individual probabilities so long as AI intersect AJ is the empty set for I not equal to J. Okay, so this condition is a little annoying the first time you see it. So let's draw it out in a picture. So I'm going to draw my sample space as I always like to do, um, just as a square box. And this uh, statement here says that for any two different sets, subsets of the sample space, for any two different ones, they do not overlap. So the way I'm going to draw that is like this. Instead of drawing circles in the sample space, I'm going to draw lines that divide up my sample space such that no two subsets overlap. So now the intersection of any of these two subsets is the empty set because they have no elements in common. 
So this says, if you're interested in the probability of a union of sets that do not overlap, then you should calculate the individual probabilities and add them all up. If you are interested in the probability of a countable union of sets that do not overlap, and in fact, we don't say they do not overlap, we call them pairwise disjoint. If you're interested in the probability of a union of pairwise disjoint sets, they do not overlap, then what you should do is calculate the probability of each set and add them all up. That's probably the hardest uh, axiom of probability to understand. But hopefully you can see that it's essentially just count the probability of each set by itself and then just add up all those probabilities. Are we doing okay with that example? I mean, not that example, that axiom. Stone Cold Silence usually tells me no. So maybe I will just give us a quick example of axiom three, an unplanned example of axiom three. So suppose you have a sample space that makes up a fair die. So if you wanted to think of this as a fair die, your sample space would be the integers one through six. And we'd say, let AI equal I, the set that consists of the integer I for I in one, two, three, four, and five and six. So this is A1 is equal to the set that contains one. A2 is equal to the set that contains two. A3 is equal to the set that contains three. And A4 is the set that contains only the integer four. I trust that you all will see that if you think about it for a little bit. And here, I'm just gonna make it up that if we're interested in the probability of the union my notation is a little off here. Of i equals two to four, then we would calculate that as, first calculate the probability of a two, then calculate the probability of a three, then calculate the probability of a four and add them all up. And indeed, that would find you just this area. Does that highlight a little bit better axiom three of probability? Stone cold silence makes me think no. Thank you, Jared. I feel like it's a little bit over my head right now, but um, I feel it's like it will come. But it's hard to say why? Yeah. OK. I appreciate the feedback in all forms.
is there a chance you could go back to the previous slide so I can look at the rest of that formula? A pretty good chance. Speaking of which, is that considered like a binary, like going back and seeing the formulas? Like just based on like, I'm just using it as, a, as like an example. Does it make sense though? I don't, I don't think I follow the example. So like when <laughs> you said like, is there a chance that you might go back? Um, are, you, are you trying to make this a Bernoulli distribution alley? Yeah, it's like, I'm just trying to understand like Bernoulli because I have like a really hard time grasping it. Sure, so you could say there is a Bernoulli distribution that describes whether or not I will go back to a previous slide. The outcomes are one, I go back to a previous slide, or zero, I do not go back to a previous slide. And there is some probability, it's probably pretty high, that I will move back to a previous slide. It's probably like 90%. Um, but that means 10% of the time, I won't move back to a previous slide. So the outcomes are either yes, I do move back to a previous slide or no, I don't. And there's some probability that governs whether or not I do. What's that symbol in between a sub i and a sub j? Uh, intersect. No, cap. Not cup, cap. C A P. Well, that was the answer to the question in the chat. I'm moving in. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Ali, did my did my new Bernoulli distribution go okay for you? Yeah, it makes a lot a lot more sense because it's a binary, but like one of them has a higher percentage of happening. Correct. Right. The Bernoulli distribution describes any binary outcomes, but the um, the outcomes don't have to have equal probabilities. Uh, the thing with the cap, that's AI cap AJ, right? Correct. Okay, just making sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I missed the question in the chat about the cup and cap issue, so my bad. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we're moving on to the example that I had uh, originally planned. We're going to provide an example of a probability function. So I'm going to write out the probability of the set A to be the cardinality of A divided by the cardinality of S for A, a subset of S. And by turning this into um, the sizes of ratio of the sizes of sets, we will get out a number between 0 and 1. We can prove it really pretty easily by checking the axioms of probability. The first one just says that if you put in the sample space to this function, you should get out one. And indeed we do. You just take the argument of the probability function and you calculate the cardinality of the argument in the numerator. Okay, so the first axiom of probability holds. The second one isn't too bad because the cardinality as a function takes you from sets in the sample space to the natural numbers. So as long as the sample space is not empty, let me write that just a touch neater. The, 
then the second axiom will always hold. Let me say this one a few more times. This is like take a set A. Now, the probability function calculates the cardinality of A. And cardinality as a function, this is pipe dot pipe, and the dot is just supposed to represent the placeholder for the argument, takes you from sets in the sample space to the natural numbers. Well, the natural numbers are non-negative. Because the natural numbers are non-negative, the numerator is going to be non-negative, and the denominator is non-negative. So we should get out an always positive number. Further, we could get out zero if the cardinality of the set A was zero. And we're going to rule out the cardinality of the set S being equal to zero, because we don't need to talk about probabilities of things that never happen. So this is one of those axioms that's really not that hard to check, but it's wrapped up in so much notation that it takes a minute. Are we okay with this one? The Can cardinality. you reiterate the uh, second check? It's greater than zero because one to one? Oh, this is the cardinality as a, as a function. Okay. So it's like if you were to give cardinality a name, you would give it the name of, you know, pipe set pipe. But when you write out a function in this notation, like if you were going to do f from s to t, you don't write out the argument. So the way you write this out is just put a little dot there to say there's something that goes in the middle there. And what we're saying is cardinality always returns a natural number. Since cardinality always returns a natural number, it's guaranteed to be not negative, since this is positive divided by positive. But A could be the empty set, in which case the numerator here is 0. A could be the empty set, in which case the numerator is 0. And in that case, we have greater than or equal to zero. OK. Let's check the third axiom. So this is just saying calculate the cardinality of the argument. And divide by the cardinality of the sample space. That's just the definition of our function. But the third axiom says that the ANs as subsets of S are disjoint. They do not overlap. So if we're going to calculate the cardinality of a bunch of sets that don't overlap, all you have to do is calculate the cardinality of each set and then add them up. So that's just like saying add up the cardinality of each a n and divide by the cardinality of the sample space. So I'm just going to take this one over the sample space and bring it into the sum, which we can totally do because it has no subscript ends in it. And really, this is just new notation for the probability of a n. So this example here is our first example of a probability function. It takes in sets, and it just calculates a ratio, a fraction, of the sizes of the sets relative to the sample space.
And in fact, if you just go to our syllabus, and then scroll down to the first book listed. If you scroll down to the first book listed and go to the website, in chapter one, section 1.4, and this is all in the email I sent you all today. So in case you don't catch it right now, remember this is being recorded and it's in the email. Look, this is where the book starts for probability functions. This is exactly where the book starts for probability functions. The only difference is I don't think by just presenting this function to you, you get a very good understanding of probability. So I start you with, with density functions. But nonetheless, chapter 1.4 in this textbook is a very good reference for the exact same material we're going to be covering all week. Okay, so you all are going to practice all week with this function. It turns out counting the size of arbitrary sets is not an easy thing to do. And so the rest of the week's YouTube videos are all about counting sets, counting the number of elements in sets. And that's what y'all are gonna practice for um, basically the rest of the week. So for now, I'm gonna take a quick detour to discrete versus continuous distributions. And then I'm going to bring the whole discussion right back. Statisticians deal with density functions. Defined on countable, which includes finite. and uncountable spaces. And in fact, we broadly define two classes of distributions based on the size of the space on which the density function is defined. We broadly classify distributions based on the size of the sample space the density is defined. Distributions defined on countable spaces are called discrete distributions. and distributions defined on uncountable spaces are called, whoops, continuous distributions. So what we've done for the past week is basically go through examples of countable spaces that define discrete distributions like the Bernoulli, the binomial, or the discrete uniform. We've also gone through and defined, I think just two distributions on uncountable spaces. So we've defined two continuous distributions, the gamma, and the normal distribution. The normal distribution comes up a lot in the world of statistics. It's not obvious why yet, but it comes up a lot. Okay, so we are going to add to our course notes then these two new definitions of discrete and continuous distributions. 
So if you said on. gamma and normal are continuous. What were the discrete ones? Uh, Bernoulli. Okay. Binomial. And there's a discrete uniform, which is what we're dealing with most of this week. Will those definitions be included, or will those examples of the class of discrete versus continuous be included in the definition? Uh, let me go back one just so we can be clear. This distributions defined on discrete spaces are called discrete distributions, and that is the class of distributions that I'm talking about. Gotcha. Discrete okay. distributions are like their own class of distributions. And then there's a separate class of distributions called continuous. And can you rattle off those uh, examples again? Bernoulli and... Yeah, so for the discrete, the examples we've seen so far are Bernoulli, binomial, and there's a discrete uniform. And for the other? For the continuous is gamma and normal. And now there are hundreds of others of both of these, but these are the ones we've only seen so far. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, totally. So we're going to use the size of the spaces to help us uh, understand why probability is not equal to density. And I'm going to start by reminding you that instead of probability being equal to density, probability is area under a density function. So here, I'm going to draw for us a completely made up gamma distribution which is a continuous distribution. And I'm gonna use that to highlight why density cannot be equal to probability. So if probability is area under this density function, then I ask you all how much area is under this density function at the point A. One. So what are you going to get out here? If you evaluate this, you're going to get out. Oh, you get nothing. I'm sorry. Ah, there we go. <laughs> there is no probability under uh, the density function at the point A. This is indeed equal to zero. You essentially get out the antiderivative of F at A minus the antiderivative of F at A. And so you get zero. But notice, there's no probability at A, but density at A is not equal to zero. There is some density at this point. It is whatever number that is. I don't know what it is, but I know it's not zero. And yet probability at A is zero. And this is the example you should keep in mind for why probability and density are different things. And correct, we could find the probability for any interval on the x-axis. Because there is area under intervals along the x-axis, we can find probability for intervals. But on continuous distributions, that is like smooth functions, we can't find probability at points. Or we can, but we know it's equal to 0. And yet, there is density at particular points. So we need to keep in mind as we go through this course that probability is area under functions 
And indeed, at this point, it is 3.50. I have left the very last slide for us for this lecture as a video to watch on Wednesday. And the rest of the videos for this week are going to be all about you dealing with density function, uh, probability functions that look like this. It may not seem like that at first, but I promise it is. Okay, all, thanks for your time today. I appreciate your questions and your engagement and your interactions. I'll be in office hours on Wednesday and Friday. If you want to join me, please do. I'll stop recording now. Thanks, Nolan. See you. Thanks, Jonathan. See you.